Okay. Hello everybody, welcome to the Open Data Institute. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here and everyone who's watching online on the live stream to this uh, Friday lunchtime lecture with Dave Whiteland from My Society. Um, Dave is a developer at My Society who joined My Society about six years ago. Uh, My Society is a not-for-profit social enterprise um, which runs projects designed to sort of give people the power to change things. Um, they've got various projects around the world, including Fix My Street, which some of you may know about, and Pledge Bank. Um, Dave's sort of been travelling around the world with My Society work for a while, working in places as diverse as Uruguay, Uganda, and Malaysia. Um, indeed, the sort of seed or origin of this talk was actually Dave coming in to tell us um, about work he's done with civil society in all over Africa. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about Every Politician, which is a project which simply and ambitiously aims to make data available on every politician in the world. Um, so, without further ado, Dave is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we should have lots of time for questions afterwards. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dave. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, as uh, I've got 20 minutes, and as I mentioned, about 300 slides to get through, so we're going to uh, power through this. Questions at the end, I hope you've got interesting questions. Uh, for what might at first uh, analysis appear to be quite a boring topic, uh, uh, data, well, let's see. I'm going to tell you what the project is. Uh, you kind of know it's data, uh, then who we are, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and then finish with some examples about how this data is being used. Right, so what is Every Politician? Every Politician is a project that, uh, with the ambitious goal of making data available on every politician in the world. Now, you're probably already thinking, Dave, you might have to define some of your terms there. And you're right, what do we mean by politician? Uh, for now, we mean members of the national legislatures. So that means top-level uh, politicians in uh, things, for example, in the UK, obviously, would be, for example, the House of Commons. Later, we're going to pick up the executive branches, regional and local. What do we mean by the world? Well, we started by saying every country, but if you've studied either... Uh, maps or human society, you'll know that country gets a little bit fractal towards the edges of definition, but so far we've got 232 to 233 later, uh, things like the European uh, Parliament, uh, other jurisdictions, and when Mr. Musk gets his project sorted out, we'll probably be having the Parliament on Mars as well. Um, and we're making it on, uh, available. What do we mean by that? It's a digital project, so we're publishing data in a useful, consistent format. The consistent format is what I will keep coming back to during the talk. Because we're in the Open Data Institute, you're most interested in what I mean by data. Um, and as you know, data is the catalyst for innovation, uh, according to the ODI. So to start with, for every politician, what we mean by that is the name and, if possible, the factional party of the politician. That alone, as core data, is already useful to somebody out there. Actually, there's a lot more that we do get and that we want to get. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to highlight some examples of gender being an interesting one because we're running a crowdsourcing project because that data is, broadly speaking, missing from most of these data sets in the world. Identifiers, when we are getting data from external sources, um, <clears throat> we preserve the identifiers so that our data obviously maps and links through to the uh, sources we're getting it from. Um, and voting records is an example of data which is, is going to turn the data that we're collecting into a more useful um, set, which we'll look at at the end. What format are we doing this in? Uh, the trick is to keep it simple and keep it useful. So we're presenting the data in two ways. Well, OK, four ways. Um, the first way is CSV, comma separated value, the um, uh, next door neighbor, friendly next door neighbor of, of data. It's the one that people open in their spreadsheets, easy to consume. But we're also making it available because we are um, proper nerds as uh, structured data in JSON. We're using the open standard of Popolo. There's a link here. You, some of you might be familiar with Popolo. Um, it's a, a, a standard for uh, presenting information about, for example, politicians. A key thing is we're using it with our own consistent conventions. I said there were um, three, four, uh, maybe four formats. We are also provide uh, libraries for developers. Uh, and the main one we're using is the Every Politician gem because we're, most of the code for Every Politician has been written in Ruby, so we are dogfooding. Um, it's also been ported to Python, thank you Mark. Um, uh, other language uh, coming soon. The point about a library means that a developer can transcend the format that the data is actually in. Here's an example. Uh, this is Ruby. Uh, if, you require, if you use the gem, um, 
within moments you are playing with data without having to fiddle around wondering about how, you, how to get it or whether or not it is the most recent. You got it and it will be. The library takes care of that. But another format is actually we have a website where this data is summarised and presented, uh, uh, which means HTML is a format beloved of search engines and school projects. Um, but actually the website is going to develop into something we think over time uh, bigger and more interesting than that, so watch that space. A thing which is surprising to the nerds here is that underlying all of this is no database. We're storing our data in files, um, JSON and CSV. Those files are built by a build process and we're managing a lot of this with Git. Um, the decision not to have a database is one that I'm happy to discuss in more detail at the end uh, with questions. If you're interested in it, you have to be a particular nerd to find that interesting. Another thing about this data is its timeliness, is that although political cycles you might think happen every general election, uh, and the general election in average around the world happens about every four or five years in, in most uh, legislatures, because we're covering so many countries that means we get about one a week. But actually political data changes much faster than that because Politicians resign, uh, politicians change their names, politicians vote daily, suddenly the activity is quite, uh, quite high. A key thing about this, uh, the mantra and the dogma of this project is we are only uh, making data available if we can do so in a useful and consistent way. If we cannot, we do not present that data. An example of that is educational records. It would be fantastic to compare the educational standards of members of different legislatures around the world. At the moment, we're not making that data available because we don't know a group that wants to do that work that can provide us with a useful way of representing that, uh, things like educational records in a way which is consistent enough to make those comparisons. Strings alone wouldn't be useful. You've already got, as you can imagine, we have some internationalization adventures with working with this data. Having said that, we do collect the data even if we're not using it, so we're archiving it for further use. <coughs> right, I say we, who are we? As uh, Tom mentioned at the start, my society, most of you probably know about us in the UK because we run sites like uh, They Work For You, uh, Write To Them, the FOI site, what do, they, uh, uh, what, what do They Know, the FOI site, Fix My Street. Many of these are platforms which we also make available um, for groups to use around the world, which is my work with the international team, is how I came to travel so widely to help people use it. Um, and we also run the Tic Tac conferences um, uh, investigating the impacts of civic technology uh, because it's, we're pioneers having done that for 12 years. Uh, within the, uh, my society, the Every Politician team is actually based in Bristol and they're mostly devs. Uh, and within that team, I'm Dave, I mention this so that you can address your questions to me personally at the end. Um, and as you already know, my background is technical, so um, we can go a bit nerdy at the end if that is what the, the audience wants. Um, Theyworkforyou.com is relevant to every politician because in a way it is the catalyst for this work. They Work For You is um, the parliamentary monitoring site in the UK which lets you put in your postcode, for example, and find out who you're... interested in badminton or badges you can be notified whenever those items come up in uh, the business of Parliament uh, we send about 30,000 emails every day the reason I mentioned that to citizens in the UK who have registered for that notification system the reason I mentioned that this is a good example of what happens when you make structured data available it suddenly becomes useful the ODI doesn't need convincing of that way um, in this capacity with they work for you we're operating in the mode of a parliamentary monitoring organization or a PMO um, these are examples of PMOs in other countries that we actively partner with. There are many more around the world. And the reason I've told you all this is because it is fundamentally the business of running a, a PMO site that is the catalyst for every politician ex uh, existing. You cannot run a site like that unless you have the data. And the minimum data is who are the representatives. Uh, in some countries it's easy. In the UK, uh, Parliament uh, makes it available through an API with unique identifiers. We're almost living in a, in a data heaven compared to other countries. In some countries it's hard, and in some countries it's almost impossible to find out the names of the representatives. And those are not necessarily the countries you expect. It's not necessarily a, a lack of technical ability that is preventing that information being available. Um, I mentioned this, uh, I, I sped through on there. Getting the data is hard and the data is messy, so every PMO needs to solve this problem. Um, 
we want to do that for them by collating the data into a standard format, used consistently, which allows tool reuse. The key thing about this, of course, is in the civic tech world, a lot of effort is being uh, wasted reproducing the same, solving the same problems because the data is in a different format. I've switched back to my data color slide here to point out that actually standardization is not enough. If everyone uses Popolo, that's a great start, but actually as soon as you try and compare, the, way, the trouble with uh, an open standard like Popolo is it's very expressive. So it can express all the different forms of parliament. The catch with that is the way you've chosen to use it can be different from the, a group doing the same thing in the country next to you. So actually, not only is this about standardization, the key thing about our project is that we are enforcing consistency on the way we use the standard. Um, so as I mentioned, this is, uh, uh, the reason this is so important is because from a PMO's point of view, we think that the inability to get the data or the effort in getting the data has probably led to PMOs failing to get off the ground at all. But also, it's a common uh, uh, surprise that when projects do start, within years, they're struggling to keep up with the data because of the way it's changed or presented. But this isn't just about PMOs. That happened to be the catalyst for the way that this started. But obviously, the data we're producing is useful for journalists, researchers, historians, and even citizens. So, how are we doing it? I'm galloping because, like I said, 300 slides. Um, uh, the answer is automation, of course. We're getting data from multiple sources. We'll have a quick look what those sources are to come, and the humans confirm what's going on. So the bot automates, and the humans curate. We are getting from sources such as official websites or APIs. Unofficial sources, the PMO groups I've mentioned, are fantastic sources of data, on, in, particularly in countries where that data is hard to come by, because that is their mission to expose it. Twitter journalists might be keeping a Twitter list of the MPs in uh, his country. Um, uh, election results sites are a great way to find out who is uh, going to be a uh, who is the representative, because that is the time when the public is most interested in what's going on. So that's when journalistic effort is also most directed at exposing data. Um, Wikidata uh, is a, a great source. We'll have a quick look at that. Gender Balance is a crowdsourced um, uh, project that we're running to get the gender of individual politicians. How do we find these sources? The answer is we use local expertise. Um, PMO groups are the best people to ask, um, or any locals who are politically active, particularly journalists, and where can we find this data? Can you point us at it? The local language Wikidata or Wikipedia. I mentioned Wikidata, not everybody might know. Wikidata is the uh, Wikimedia Foundation's database project, which broadly speaking is the database underneath projects like Wikipedia. Um, we have volunteers who, who uh, are enthusiastically sourcing uh, regional and local sources for us. And maybe you. Uh, talk to me afterwards if you think you know something about the political, source, uh, political data sources in a country that we seem to be um, incomplete with. I mentioned sources don't need to be official. They don't need to be complete. They don't even need to be current because we're merging and collating all this data. So even if a Twitter list has only got three MPs' Twitter handles on it, that's useful for us. Uh, I mentioned Wikidata. Wikidata is a, is a fantastic resource for us. For one reason, it's a very good way to get transliterations of politicians' names. If you want to know what David Cameron's name is in uh, Mandarin or Thai, we have that data because somebody will have written a Wikipedia page about it, and it will have, in that nation's, uh, in that language's Wikipedia, and in that way it will have come into Wikidata, or perhaps the other way around. Um, but also, when we get data that we know is wrong and we need to correct it, we don't correct it in every politician. We correct it upsource in Wikidata, so we're contributors as well. Uh, the benefit of that, of course, is it means that other people then can then continue curating it. How are we doing it? We're doing it with Scrapers, and it's a, uh, Scraper is a program which basically goes to a website and gets the data for you. Um, some of these Scrapers are actually getting data from APIs or uh, online spreadsheets, or indeed Wikidata. Um, it's a big operation. We have over actually we have over 600 Scrapers at the moment, but this is growing weekly. Um, you can imagine that's quite a big task, which is why so much of the automation um, is being managed by our clever little bot. Um, all those sources produce data in CSV, the, the, the bottom level of useful data from our point of view, and then we merge from that. Uh, almost every source we visit every 24 hours because we are looking for changes. When a new source comes in, that's a big job to add it, but from that point on, what we're interested in is how the data is changing. The nerds amongst us, might be, might, you might realize this is why Git is so useful, because Git is especially good at recording changes. 
Uh, and we are aware that these sources can disappear. Um, so actually, we're archiving the stuff that we get so that if a source does go offline, and there are both technical and political reasons why that might happen, uh, as well as it's very common for a source to disappear after an election um, because uh, people redo their technology with the new broom, um, we're archiving that data as well. All this in the automation is happening with our little bot, does lots of things, including blogging and tweeting. So um, I would encourage you to have a look at its Medium account, which you can get to from here, or if you search for every politician bot, you'll get it. The, the bot uh, talks about its work um, and what it's like to work with humans um, in, in details both data and technical. But this is what the bot won't do. As, although it is doing all this work because it is a, we, obviously you're already thinking, hmm, scalable, because this is a big problem, it all comes down to the bot doing as much as possible until the humans check the actual reconciliation and addition of data. And a simple example of why this is too complex for us to attempt to solve it with computer science is how can you be sure when two members are the same person? There are precedents of identical twins being politicians in the same legislature. Um, you can't rely on name matches because human beings, um, some of you have the same names. Um, and some of you change your names in the course of your careers, and even birth dates uh, are not as uh, useful as you might imagine for seeing if people are the same. Uh, Korean politicians have a predisposition to have their birthdays on the 1st of January for good cultural reasons. Um, it is a dynamic data set. I think of it as an ant farm rather than perhaps a sloth zoo because the data is changing. We, while I've been here, there will have been several updates from the bot, pull requests with data to go in. Um, because we're managing it with Git, um, it means that actually if you are basing your data visualization maybe on a particular snapshot, that is never going to change, which is a handy convenience, which if we were driving it with a database would be much harder to manage. Um, we also have mechanisms to make sure you, are, you can check that you are getting the very latest data if that's what you want. And of course, the bot will um, uh, tug your web hook if you want your uh, program to be notified whenever the data you're interested in has changed. Uh, the nerds here can uh, come back to that slide for the technology we're using because what's more interesting is how all this data is actually being used out in the real world. Um, I should mention we're about 18 months into this project, um, which we're in a good baseline where we can see this happening, but there's a lot more to come. First of all, obviously, you could build a PMO site based on this data. This was the original uh, objective, and we're uh, working with some partners um, to demonstrate this. You could write your own using the data, or you could fork somebody else's, because remember when I said that we're making this data available in a consistent format. If somebody has written the code and it works for their country, you can expect it, broadly speaking, to be easy to get it to work for your own. Um, of course, there'll be layers of local data that you'll want to add. Um, that is kind of part of the point, is of why we say you make your database um, and add that on top of it. When you want to change the data that we're interested in, if you are a PMO, you've already become a, a source from our point of view. You're a great cust custodian of this data. But we encourage you to update the source. Maybe that is a Google spreadsheet, or um, which then updates every politician, which then updates your site. So we want, when the, uh, the, our PMO partners run these projects, they're running them um, as part of the cycle. They don't become sources in their own right. We're generating them from a source which they're contributing to. Here's an example of the Zimbabwe and Kuba Kazim running. This data is coming out of every politician. Uh, Here's an example of the Ukrainian policy tracker. So this is a group that uh, wanted to show which politicians are supporting a particular policy. Um, the policy is the hard work there. That is what the local group is great at. What they didn't need to waste time doing was getting the list of politicians against which they can then compare to see who is supporting it. Gender balance is a great example where we are uh, adding to our data because we have individual politician data we know that the Interparliamentary Union already publishes the percentage of gender balance in every legislature. But that data is self-reported, and it is on the top level of the legislature. If you had the data for every politician in the legislature, and you have maybe the attendance records, maybe there's some interesting things that you could pick out about uh, whether or not um, the different genders affects things like not just attendance, but also maybe voting patterns. Maybe it's the case that uh, a country is more li likely to rescind the death penalty when it's got at least 33 3% women on its legislature. Questions like that have never been able to be asked globally before because the data set doesn't exist. Now we have a data set of a lot of politicians. We can crowdsource with this game that people have been playing around the world. Um, uh, you swipe left and right, not unlike the dating applications which I'm told young people use. Um, 
Uh, and you can pick the legislature. We invite you to do it on one that you're familiar with. We don't want you to guess, and we help you do the research. Uh, and over time, of course, we can build up a crowdsourced pattern where we have official sources with gender, where we have compared the results of gender balance. We've actually found errors in the official source this way. Uh, another example is names.csv. We know about all the politicians in the world. So uh, we actually, the bot um, generates uh, a file. It's a very big file now. I think it's got a, in the region of 200,000 names in it because there are several names for every politician because some politicians go by more than one name, but also it contains all the transliterations and alternate spellings in different languages. The reason this is a useful thing is maybe you're a journalist who maybe gets 11 million leaked emails from a South American country and wonders, are there any politicians mentioned in this? This is a very good starting base with maybe with other tools like Open Calais to dive into it. Um, we also make this available uh, for every legislature as well, as well as the file for all the names of all the politicians in the world. Uh, Polit Whoops, you might be familiar with, is a, a group that is uh, open state funded uh, that um, naughtily, according to some people, uh, tracks and publishes tweets that are deleted by politicians. In order to do that, they gather um, Twitter lists um, uh, who to track. Um, of course, we can help with that because now we, are, we have lists of uh, Twitter handles for politicians in uh, so many countries. But uh, an example in the UK, um, they were able to augment their existing data very easily and add the party membership of the MP. They already had the lists of, of MPs, um, but they were able to augment the data with the data that we're providing. Right, for the heavyweight nerds amongst you, you'll just think, let me get at the data. Of course you can get at the data. This is a plot of uh, age frequency of the current Australian Senate done in R. Here's a bit of Ruby for you for finding the baby of the house, which in the UK is, the, is uh, she's quite famous because the, uh, it was involved in the Scottish referendum as well. Um, this is the youngest uh, member uh, in the legislature. You can see I'm using the Ruby gem. I say I want the UK, House of Commons. Um, you get your nerd to do your um, thinking for you, and out pops uh, a list. Uh, if there's any unexpected pattern there, that shows the value of being able to dive into data. But if you followed what I've said and it's been true, I could change the name of the country and the legislature and get a different result. Here's another example where um, Oxfam wanted to set up a, or it's scrolled down here, contact your representative at the bottom. I think this is doing it through Facebook. Um, and we uh, provided a, a, a tool for them which took the every politician data mapped to uh, with a postcode location mapper. So basically, from given a location, we can identify the representative. And using every politician data from that representative, you've got the contact details. So Oxfam used this as a, um, have been using this um, for various campaigns they've been running. What is the future for this? As I said, we're about 18 months in. Um, we want to move from having data about who they are to what they do. And in many ways, that really comes down. The key de data there is voting records. The unusual thing about representatives is that their work, their effect, to some extent, can be quantified in terms of votes. So uh, we are moving on to getting that. Um, we want more width, um, so more, more countries, more legislatures, or more types of politicians. Uh, more depth of data, the data that we do have on individuals, as well as... I've barely mentioned it, but we also collect historical data as well, of course. So whenever I talk about consistency between legislatures, that's also consistency with past terms as well, which, which means the comparison of the, where I drew the frequency of age distribution for the Senate. If you um, have uh, run that over the past terms as well, you can start to see how parliaments are changing over time. Um, and of course, as we're doing more and more, the tools that are being used for using this data, we hope more of those will become available. Some of them we are building ourselves and some of them people are building using our data. They're building them for their own needs. This is a, a key part about why we think this is a useful way to approach it. They're building them for their own needs, but by definition, their code is likely to be useful for other people because we are ensuring the consistency of the data. That was um, fast. Um, I hope you were breathing through that because I wasn't. Uh, so now I am happy to take any questions or anything that I have skimmed over or missed out or anything that you simply don't believe. Um, you mentioned that you use humans for oh, Sorry, we'll, we'll, send a, we'll send a mic to you. Uh, Ian McGill from Spend Network. You mentioned that you use... Actually, I've got a couple of questions. Go Firstly... On. You mentioned that you use humans to curate yep. the data, and, I, and, and that seems like it might have scale issues. 
Yes. Yeah. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit about yep. that. And then one other question. We work with procurement data a lot, so we're very interested in identifying uh, public bodies and whether you'd done anything around that or had any thoughts towards right. that. So the first one, the first one, which is about the curation of the data, of course. Um, there is obviously a scaling issue here. Um, so one of the things which makes it doable is we trust, to some extent, we trust our upstream, upstream sources. So for example, when we ran the uh, Baby of the House um, scripts yesterday, um, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to run this on the world rather than perhaps pick them? So we did that. And we got, a, uh, I'm going to come back to your question, Blue, because this is a, this is an, a, a, a narrative build up for it. OK. Um, no, that's fine, that's okay. okay. Um, but if I don't answer it, we'll come back to it. Um, and when we ran it uh, across all the legislatures of the world, we chose to ignore any for which we had less than 50% birth, uh, birthday uh, data, because that's how we're calculating age. Um, and when we ran that data, we found that the youngest politician in the world is minus 0 0.2 months old, um, <laughs> years old. Uh, and uh, they're in Guatemala, I think, I think it was. Um, uh, and we thought, oh, that's our data being wrong. But actually, it turns out upstream, the official source is wrong and really does on the web page have a zero years old politician. It's a, as we all know, data is, has this nature. Our remedy to that is to contact them and try them and to get them to update the source upstream. Or if we can't do that, then we would then uh, try and put it into Wikidata once we have some confidence what the actual date should be. Now, the reason I mention that is that once we've discovered that, we can add a check for more validation. We're not trying to guess them all, but we can kind of guess that we're not expecting to see any politicians that are born in the future coming in. So, we could, so some of it we can automate, but at the, at the bottom line, we trusted incoming data. Whether or not that member is really a member of parliament in Guatemala isn't something that we necessarily would be experts in. So if it is coming from an official source, to start with, we trust the upstream source. So that, that's one way that we scale it. Um, the other thing is that once it's in there, actually it's a hit, but then we're really monitoring changes. So the bot can, when the data changes, then we're notified that this person's name has changed. And we think, actually, that, if that is the case, we would expect to find that reflected in somewhere other than the, perhaps the single record it's coming from. There is a scalable issue there. And, when we work with a PMO group, that would be an example where we would push that legislature over to them to start to become the custodians of that data, because that's the beautiful thing about pushing all the responsibility upstream. Um, it's, not a, it's not avoiding responsibility, but it's a scalable thing. And when you find and work with local experts, you, they want and you want to, them to, to do that work for you. So that's part of the solution. And the public bodies? And the public bodies is... Um, uh, it's, we haven't done much with what, what perhaps also you'd call uh, politically exposed people as well, the PEPs. Um, open corporates is a very comparable project. You can probably, and you'd imagine that if people are coming up in both, we would have that, we'd want their IDs in there as well. Uh, and we'll, we haven't done it, I don't think we've got any open corporate data in yet, but um, of course um, we're friends together, my society and open corporates, so that's something which I'm sure is going to come into it. Sorry, I actually meant government institutions, have you done any work gathering and... No, no. Um, we've only worked... Legislatures, executives and some committee sh memberships, but that's it at the moment. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, are there more questions in the room? If you could just say your name. Wahome, um, I run a small city called Revolution Works. Um, I just wondered, you mentioned um, your team is mostly in Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered having a more globally distributed team just to get, uh, you know, someone coming from a completely different culture? I saw so many queries that I would be interested in running on every politician that, even from just, you know, the few examples you gave, uh, and just from what I read of this data structure, um, I wouldn't be able to run. I mean, you, the example you gave was baby of the house. I mean, I, you know, from a completely different cultural perspective, I can imagine any number of other kinds of queries that I'd want to run based on local, just local cultural insights that perhaps if the design of the data and the platform generally was a bit more culturally or globally distributed, we may be able to get that, even, even more, even that, more intelligence. That actually, that is a, is a very good point from which we learned the hard way back in my society's history. When we ran They Work For You as the parliamentary site, monitoring site in the UK, one of the first groups we then worked with who, wanted to, who thought it would be great to run a similar project was in Kenya, the Maslendo project. And we thought it would be easy to simply take the code that was running in the UK and run it there. And it turns out 
that not just culturally, but simply the differences between even parliaments that are modelled on the British system are already very different. And we ran into interesting um, difficulties to the extent that we actually um, uh, tried to build a more general um, platform to try and do this and have run into problems with that, which is why we've ended up actually in many, thinking that we can help more people better by just providing the basic data. But then, as for being based in Bristol or specifically in the UK, absolutely that is a limitation of this approach, which is why I hope the, the idea of using um, local expertise to, to gather, source the data and also identify what data is important. Um, one very simple example of that is we're in the UK, we're used to a constituency based system where you have individual uh, members representing the constituency, but in many parliaments around the world and cultures, you have groups that are factionally based and the, and the composition of parliament is quite different. And that kind of thing is um, something where if we have more people, if we're working with more partners in the countries involved, we're less likely to make mistakes about the structure of the data and not anticipating how the way these things work. So I think there's scope for more. Yeah. If I could just follow up on that one quickly. You mentioned this sort of ambition or providing the sort of framework in which parliamentary monitoring organisations could exist all over the world. I'm really interested by the idea of trying to get those to emerge in sort of less democratic environments. Is the challenge there a, a data challenge or is it a sort of cultural challenge? There, there is a data challenge. An example would be uh, Qatar is one of the countries we don't have data of the representatives for. Um, uh, and that might be a surprise because in other, in most uh, places, in most other spheres, you would expect that to be a fully functioning uh, area. But it's quite hard to get the data for that. Um, we also work. Uh, we're recently running a project uh, with a group that are using every politician data to run a right to your representative um, service in Iran. And that group, for, um, for reasons of their expediency, are not operating from within the borders of the country. So there are issues with all of this, which make it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, hi, Paul Cannon. Um, just a question on, it sort of leads back to the question on, on um, sort of, uh, um, being culturally, well, providing culturally useful data. Yeah. You were saying that you archive data and you only put it up yeah. once you've got a useful amount. Yeah. Is that on an international level or do you do that on a national level? Um, we're, for example, we have um, pretty thorough election data, but we're not publishing it, but it is in the Git repository. Um, similarly, we might, be, we might be capturing educational data at the moment, I'm not sure. But the other thing that's doing, uh, doing that I haven't mentioned is that the way the scrapers run, and um, the scrapers running a, a slightly clever thing, is that when they visit a page, they uh, are also archive that HTML into a branch on the, on the repository of the scraper. So we're actually archiving the web pages. So if there's anything we're missing now, we can go back to it in the future. This matters because data uh, sources disappear. And if we didn't think, for example, the, uh, an example might be, I don't know, maybe blood group in, uh, uh, in Asia where that, where that is published for politicians or um, religion, uh, for example. Or, or, or a tribe, exactly that. If we're not capturing it now and, this, and the source disappears, we've lost that. So actually what we're doing, we are capturing, we are also archiving the HTML that we're scraping from so we can go back and revisit it if we have overlooked stuff. And we certainly have overlooked stuff because of the, the decision about what we are choosing to collect at the moment. That's a, that's a good example of it, yeah. And there's no way that, that a group from could approach you and say, hey, can we um, play with some of your archive data that you don't publish yet? Oh, well, I'm not, when I say we don't publish it, I mean we don't publish it in the consistent format. But it's all there in the, it's all being, it's all being stored in Git, so it's all there, it's public. Oh, it's all, it's all, all oh, yeah. open. Oh, right, the, sorry, yeah. that didn't come across from what you yeah. said. Okay. Have we got more questions in the room? Yeah, sorry, someone else. Just again to yeah. just pick on our point again. Um, have you thought about just a more federated design structure for the for the actual metadata and for the actual just the platform itself, rather than just the data? Um, so, if I was interested in yeah, if I was interested in pushing to get um, an interesting you know view of you know an interesting way in which people can actually then pull the data. Uh, but using a standard, you know, uh, and even, you know, a more feathered specification, a more superficial specification that doesn't predetermine what the metadata is. I mean, can, you, can I contribute at that level in a more federal, more loosely so affiliated kind of way? There, um, are, there are given two. My interest, so 
as a contributor to the design of the metadata and um, and, and, the, and the platform yeah. and the, and the, obviously the API that gets you know that gets the data out rather than just the data itself. There isn't an API. We are only any data that we have. We're we're making available. So the way you could co contribute that is if you showed us a use case and said I could really use this data, you're not collecting it. If there if if it's clear that there's a way of consistently representing that, we'd be interested in in adding it to the data. Um, uh, and the uh, I, the educational example is one that is completely without, uh, we don't actually have a group that has even approached us about that, but somebody somewhere will be doing research into the relative educational standards of qualification or whatever. And if they come to us and say, we've got this way of, of, of representing that, why aren't you adding it to our data? We go, okay, let's do that. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, uh, another way to contribute is to, if you do anything yeah. with this data and build on top of it, yeah. that's also really useful as well. Yeah. I mean, sorry, I have a unique use case for education per se because, Great. I mean, I run an, a data platform called Open Report, and one of the things that I track, right, so you can create your own series on Open Report, but one of the series I'm tracking is essentially nepotism in right. politics. Um, so appointments to, say, the cabinet, not... You know, well, we're not talking about the third world, you, you know, stereotypically, we're talking about the UK. You um, hit something very simple straight away. And that's away. an interesting cultural facet that may not be captured you know, by a certain designer, but someone else who's interested in that cultural perspective of just local politics yeah. in the UK would find interesting and would be able to then push and allow others to pull who at, are similarly interested. At the moment, we are, our data isn't including family relationships, for example, which is a key part of that. Yeah. But, um, of course, that's not to say... Uh, and uh, it's even possible, I think, Popolo probably already has a mechanism for representing that. So if we come across a group that wants that and we can agree that there's a useful... Um, uh, way that we can do that within the standard and use it consistently, uh, consistently we'll add it. We, we are being driven to some extent by um, the requirements of people who are approaching us who are using this data. I would like to turn a question towards the future and then I'll go to the back then. Um, so we're sort of told that we live in a, a post-truth politics age, you know, uh, and that people are, are tired of experts. Um, I wonder what you think is the sort of, what is the possibility for the future when we have these kind of open data sources? underlying our sort of political culture? Well, I don't think you can relax your scepticism of the post-fact world because something which hasn't come up uh, today, uh, apart from the fact that there was a very young, poli a, a zero-age politician, that was clearly an error. When we start looking at things like voting records, they become state-level reasons why that data might not be reliable from the official sources. So that becomes an interesting problem as well. So I think the more this data is out and the more... Personally, I don't think the biggest problem is the data being available because that's becoming more and more. I think the biggest cultural change will be people's refusal to accept journalism which isn't citing the sources that the data is coming from. That is, that is the biggest change. And hopefully by um, increasing the, the ubiquity of data, uh, the, perhaps that will become a, a, a change. Data journalism is a great example of that slowly changing is because increasingly the Guardian have been really good about that, that when they do their interesting data visualizations, they nearly always indicate where that data is coming from with the idea at the moment that nerds can play with it as well. But actually, there's a much more profound change happening. We also see it with freedom of information, that it is commonplace in the UK when the BBC makes a report that came from freedom of information, they will say that. And that is a, that is a way which over time the public have got used to understanding that that is where that information is coming from. I think a similar thing will change with data in the post-fact world. Okay, we have around 10 minutes left for questions, so I'll go to the back. Hi, uh, it's Jack right here. Um, I'm interested in the data that you haven't got. So you mentioned Qatar as an example. Um, is it easy enough for people, or will it be easy enough for people to interrogate your data set, your, your data, yeah. to say there are gaps in this data? So yeah. we have a finite number of countries. We have some basic information that we want to be able to get hold of from all of those. So is it, able, is it possible for me to do a search that says, show me what the null results are, for instance? Um, not as easy as it should be. Um, there's a page which shows the countries we don't have any data on, and I think there are about 12 yet. Um, it, it is all, I think I can safely say it's all fascinating. The reasons why a country is not um, uh, represented can be because it is a disputed country as well, and so it's not clear, for example, um, uh, where one looks for the representatives of Palestine, for example. Um, uh, and uh, as far as the actual uh, percentage of data that we've got, when you look at the website, we do a little summary to show you, for example, we'll say that we've got 100% bio coverage if we've got some 
uh, date of birth or gender for that person or what percentage of contact details we've got or identifies as another one where if, in many cases I think in the UK it's probably true that we've got a wiki data ID for every uh, member of the current parliament uh, but um, in lots of places that's not so um, uh, but we haven't got at all which makes it very easy for you to see those things with a bit it's not that hard with a bit of Ruby so I would suggest um, that you pester us about it and then one of the brilliant nerds will make a tool for you to make that easy because obviously it's something that's useful to us because that also drives our prioritisation about hunting data. Absolutely, it sounds like a perfect place for also federated groups who might be interested in certain things. Yes. Say, All right, these are the areas that we need to yep. get some local kind of grassroots yep. action on yep. there. Uh, and thinking about it, the, the open data census that uh, Open Knowledge did had a really nice way of representing that. It was a bit, right. um, so it might be an interesting... Yeah, we're looking into that. that um, the, uh, the, obviously, we're, there's, as soon as you're in this world of data, not only is the Open Data Institute um, uh, ought to be all over it, as indeed Open Knowledge of Costs, and actually there's some interesting stuff um, to look into their um, uh, uh, format, uh, standard formats as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a question over here? Someone's more important. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dana Stabu. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, about uh, taking this into the future, and you said that you want to move from who the politicians are to uh, what the politicians do. And will, will you include uh, any data, any information on, for instance, what positions uh, and what roles they play in the, uh, in the legislatures? Yeah whether they serve in committees, whether they lead committees. And so that, that's a really good question. Uh, and we are collecting committee uh, membership data, but we're not, it's, at the moment it's not being published as the core um, uh, uh, in the Popolo files uh, because the problem with this is, um, a, a simple example that came up in a, in a discussion with the guys from Quorum is that wouldn't it be great to compare the Mayor of London with the Mayor of Madrid? But actually, it's not so straightforward that those are equivalent political roles. And the way, if you're going to, when we worry about how we represent this in data, that's an example of what we mean by do we have a way of consistently using the standard to express these uh, um, things like committee membership. So actually, we do have that data. And in fact, when I say we have the data, often you can find it in the unstable directory inside the legislature, if you look at our GitHub repo. Um, but absolutely, um, committee membership is, a, and that again is another uh, government specific. Or, or, or legislature, a specific way of, of running. In the UK, we have the bizarre situation where um, members of the executive are also members of the legislature. And most people who have, even, the, even countries that adopted, for whatever reason, our system, very quickly realise that's a crazy way to do it. So um, the committee memberships are crucial. And a good example why we know that is that any PMO trying to build a website needs that information to make that website useful. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so. I am Mateo. I am a Mateo Salazar. I am an MPA Master's in Public Administration student at LSE. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, my question is, do you have any plans to go beyond the data, like doing some in-house analysis or uh, pressure groups or anything like that? Uh, well, my... In the short term, we don't. My society has never really been an activist group. It's really it's it's non-partisan provider of services. I think would be the way to look at that. However, um, it's really hard not to do this work and not wonder yourself. You think, wow, we've got this stuff. I wonder. I wonder. Um, but I don't think that will be our responsibility. I think what we're really keen on doing is encouraging other people to take it, use it, and actually, um, academia is one of these places we need to. It's interesting that one of the things that we're working on is making this an academically citable resource. And the reason that's interesting is because um, quite often data sets that academics use um, have been published. This is an interesting thing because our data is changing all the time. And so you can't cite this without perhaps including a Git SHA, uh, which is actually super cool if you're nerd to think this is how academia should be working. But actually, the idea of getting this kind of stuff out into the research community is something that we're actively working on. Yeah. Dave, you talked about moving beyond just having politicians' names to what they do, mm -hmm. how they vote. Might we also see a future in which we have the promises they make during election campaigns, um, or indeed with, with, with sort of Brexit, we have a, a Leave EU Watch, um, which is sort of monitoring promises that, that have been made there those being published as open data which you could query? So, so I can, uh, promise trackers are something, in, in the work in the civic tech, 
almost everywhere you go, that is what people really often want because it's one of the most annoying, I think one of the dis annoying disconnects between politicians and human beings is, is, is that uh, uh, the failure to maintain promises because in our personal relationships we judge people very harshly for that kind of failure. Um, but actually it's quite a hard thing to do. I don't think we will ever be, every politician will necessarily be having the promises because that sounds to me like a very hard thing to encode quantitatively enough to make it comparative. But it's exactly the kind of thing where promise tracker site, um, where you need, to, the promise tracker needs to know about the people. At that point, we would love a, a tool or a website or websites that do that um, to be fueled by, to solve the problem of representing the promises and not need to worry about the problem about tracking who the people are because we are making that super easy. That is the plan. So I don't think we are trying to absorb the whole world of all political data representation because a lot of the data is by its nature legislative, language based and, and almost becomes a document store. And I don't think that is that's, that's so far in the future. I imagine that being the responsibility of other groups and other, other systems doing it. Hi, uh, we've got a question from ODI Aberdeen, who's our node in Aberdeen. They flagged that the Scottish um, local government elections are happening next May right. and ask whether or not there are any plans to drop down to local authority level. Yes. And they've also said that they'd like to help if they can. Yes, <laughs> great. Um, one of our, our team is up in St Andrews, so it's not that far away. Um, so the reason that we're not doing local um, or regional at the moment is simply one of scale. Um, last year was in Glow Week, um, we took on the project of getting 200 countries by the end of the week and we did that, which is quite spectacular, um, but that is just on the national level legislatures. So the only reason we're not doing local yet is because actually there's still far too much work to be done on uh, uh, national. However, if there's a group doing that work, we should talk because there's no reason why the, obviously the modelling and everything else could, could work in exactly the same way. Yeah, so it's merely a question of uh, scale and let's be honest, we have, uh, despite the superhuman achievements of the Every Politician team, they are nonetheless a finite number of human beings in one bot. So we uh, aren't doing all that, we aren't doing local yet. Actually, the other thing I should mention about that is that when you do work like this, although national is fascinating, our experience working with things like Fix My Street is that often it's local government, which is where the citizen engagement makes the biggest difference to people's lives. And the lack of accountability on that level is, a, is part of the same problem, that this, the, the business of data can go a long way to solve it. I want to ask one more question about scale, and then I'll come to a question there. As it sort of grows and grows, and both internationally you're collecting more things about what politicians do and yeah. also scaling down in terms of collecting local level. And going past because there's a lot of historical data. And so looking at the historical well. data. What, what problems does that bring up for the sort of sustainability of the sort of project as a whole in terms of sort of resourcing it? Okay. It? One simple thing is that there might come a point when we have to split our repo down to per country rather than for the world. Um, if you clone the repo, it's getting quite big, so perhaps you need to... Um, uh, do shallow clones on that. So some of it is that there is some a processing overhead as well of um, running a query which casually looks across the whole world. That starts to become uh, an issue and the way that we're handling that would be to pass that on to the big data people and say we are just give, providing the data, push that on. Um, I think the biggest problem is the scalability of staying on top of the fact that this data changes. Because even static data, even historic data changes as it gets corrected. So um, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem, which actually um, is part of what makes this so interesting. Okay, we have one more question done here, and we have five minutes left. So if anyone else has a last question, please think now. Mine is actually a follow-up on that one. Um, just to cap it at a high level, where do you see yourself? I mean, how does your vision map in the landscape of other political data projects and just generally open data projects from open democracy to right. the whole... Uh, you know, other s sets of projects around the world. Um, and specifically to that issue of resources, I mean, what's, what's the business model? I mean, is it, how's the funding, how's, you know, yeah, resources will become even more scarce yeah. as you grow then, um, the, the, the requirements and the demands. How do you sustain this and do you ever foresee that becoming a challenge to the vision yeah. um, in terms of the sourcing of funds? Would it ever be frictious? 
Yes, so one of the most grown up questions you can ever ask someone in civic tech is where is your money coming from? Um, uh, and my society has a good track record on this um, because we have been in the, I would say, in the business for about 12 years now or so. Um, so one of the things is the reason that we are getting funding for this at the moment is because it's, it's, at the moment it's clear in the general business of parliamentary monitoring organisations which, um, for which there are, there are grants available, this, the idea of solving, of trying to solve the problem of uh, encouraging tool reuse, which in the civic tech world has not been widely anything like as big and as successful as we, as we had hoped. We were part of the founders of a group called Poplus to encourage people to share civic tech. And this work has come out of that. So while that benefit to groups around the world exists, I think that the funding, the opportunity to get grants to continue this work exists. Um, one of the things which is deliberate in our, uh, the way we're using Git is we are pushing off some of the infrastructure costs to an industrial scale solution, which is GitHub. Um, we use Heroku as well. So the, the idea of that the data is is not as volatile as perhaps we are. There's a blog post that's been written about this in the context of Burkina Faso, which um, in 2014 had an uprising which, in which the parliamentary buildings were burnt down and which meant they lost their physical records. Um, so uh, nobody uh, knows, uh, nobody official knows who their parla uh, parliamentarians were before 1990. So there's a really interesting example of, of the archive value of doing work like this. Um, uh, and that is the reason I mention that is because um, it is presumptuous of any organisation to imagine that they're going to last long enough to be useful as an archive source. So we think, uh, although it is still a, quite a digital way of looking at it, we think that um, the fact that all this work is happening in GitHub is a non-trivial part of that defence. So that if the Every Politician group were to, if, it, if the worst case would happen and it were to stop, the idea that the value of the local data could still be used by local groups without needing to worry about the scale still exists. So, other, so it's feasible that a local group could take their local data and continue developing and using it um, way beyond this, even if this project were to end. That is not our anticipation at the moment, um, obviously our confidence. Um, and uh, the whole point about the project is that we think it's a central way to behave. It's a very, it's a very good question though. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite common I travelled the world for um, uh, helping partners on the ground uh, as part of the international team of my society. It's um, a very reasonable question for people who you think you're going to help to say, how do we know you're going to be here in a few years' time? In the civic tech world, that's a, it, it's a bit of an elephant in the room, I think, actually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for a really fascinating talk and letting us know about your, your project. Um, and yeah, please join me in thanking Dave. Thank you very much.